Welcome to a Friday Reads, where I talk about what I read, what I'm reading, what I hope to get to next, and uh, yeah, it's been a slow reading month, but that's okay. That's okay. I'm not upset about it. It's still generally pretty high quality. It's just that like the first half of a week, really all the reading time I have is audiobook time, or if I do end up going to the elliptical, I'll like read there. And like, then I have like, today is Thursday when I'm filming this, which I used to film these Wednesday nights, but like, I'm just, whoo, so tired when I come home Wednesdays. I'm just like, eh, I can do it tomorrow morning and then edit it. And so yeah, here I am. And that type of tiredness extends to reading. Like, I just, I, I stare at the wall a lot, or Ryan and I have been watching a lot of YouTube. <laughs> so it's not bad. I have finished well one thing and then half of something that's very long. And that's another thing is I, I'm choosing to read a very long book right now, which is not good for momentum. And then of course, the one thing I would love an audiobook for, I can't find, it's a whole thing. But we will talk about what I read because I do want to spend some time talking about one of the books I finished because like, it's it's one of those hidden gem situations that like every person who's trying to like read books they never hear about tries to find and it's like, ooh, this is exciting. I'm excited to tell people about it. And that would be Alicia. Now I say hidden gem, this is not going to be for everyone. This is not a new favorite of mine or anything like that, but it is like, if you're someone who's like, I want something unique and kind of trippy and well thought out and it's not, it's not too long. So it's, it's not going to like be too much for too long, if that makes sense. Um, Cause like, it's definitely playing with form in a way that I think could be exhausting for a longer book than this. Um, so what is this uh, about? It's about being very confused. That's what it's about, but no. Um, this is like, I, it's not self published but it's from Aqueduct Press. So like really small indie press. Um, I found this in the wild when I was on my bachelorette bar crawl. It wasn't a bar crawl, we went to bookstores and stuff like that. And I saw this at a small indie bookstore in Chicago and I'm like, I've been wanting to read this book since 2020. And it's really hard for me to get the ebook for my library. I don't really want to listen to the audiobook, so I take it. <laughs> and I'm so glad I did because I think ebook would have been fine, but I would hesitate to recommend the audio. I say that having not listened to it. But the reason why I hesitate to say that is that this is going to have like code breaks in the text. So it's prose, and then once in a while you have these kind of sort of pseudo code syntax. So if you're like someone who's done code, you'll sort of know what they mean, but they're still pretty much gibberish. But they do say things that are pretty obvious. Like, I mean, this first one is like begin program. So begin the story sort of thing. And some things are like fragmentation, corruption, resume, restart. Like there are parts of it that like, even if you don't know code, I think it's fairly as obvious as it was for me, I guess. Like you can tell, oh, there's something wrong going, happening here. Um, so because of that, I just don't know if that would work well with audio and also, a feature of this is that we're following essentially the same set of characters, but they have different names slightly in different stories. Gender is very fluid in this book. So we're mainly following um, Adrian and Anton, but they have different names sometimes. Um, sometimes Anton is Antoinette. Sometimes Adrian is, um, oh. See, for me, Adrian sounds the same in both the female and male version, but I could be wrong and maybe there's a slightly different pronunciation for the female version, but it's spelled differently <laughs> um, in the book. And so like those spelling cues held, there's a character named Hector or Helen, and I just think the visual cues work better for my brain. Now I have told you why I say physical over audio. I haven't told you anything about what this is about because <laughs> it's so hard. Um, it's a dystopian book, okay? and. I don't want to explain too much what the project is because part of the fun for me was discovering what am I actually consuming. But what I can say is we are following these sets of characters and the story is being told. And for some reason, we're kind of in this program and we know that. So that's like fairly obvious. So like this isn't something weird or like, are we in a simulation? It's fairly obvious that like, yeah, there's this code that's happening. And then suddenly in the next scene, like we're obviously still not very far from the previous scene, but we're different people or something really odd is happening or the settings changed, but it's still like we're processing grief. So our main character, Adrian, for some reason, Anton's being lost and being lost in various ways. Um, the relationship is also very different throughout the book. Sometimes they're lovers, sometimes they're siblings, sometimes they're parent child relationship. But what is always close is their love and compassion for each other. And basically Adrian's going through grief they are losing this person in all these various ways. And so that's kind of the humanity that keeps you going in this story of weirdness. And like I said, there's a dystopian plot. There is dystopian to learn about in here. And like, now that I know its whole framework, it's very much like when I read Goliath a few years ago, where I'm like, now I just want to reread it. And I could, cause it's really short. 
And maybe that's when I'll try the audio because I just don't have a lot of physical reading time. Um, because now I know, oh, that is so cool. And I'm, I'm someone who loves a unique narrative framing. And you can tell from the beginning, this is a unique narrative framing, but you don't know the purpose of it. And learning what that narrative framing is, is really cool by the end of it. And I just would love more people to read it. Another cool thing about this book, because I believe it came out in 2014 or 2015, I'd have to check, yeah, 2014, is that part of this dystopian narrative, just like many dystopian narratives, is that there is sort of this type of plague or maybe pollution factor and how society responds to that. And like, you can't help but compare that to how we responded in 2020 to the pandemic. And I just think it's really interesting seeing the things that, you know, do line up or maybe don't. And I, I like that. I think that's the part of science fiction that I really enjoy consuming. I did read this author's published work from Tor, Destroyer of Light, I think. And that one was a little long for me because I do think this author has such a vivid, unique version of world building and imagination. And she loves pulling from historical stories and twisting them. So like this is supposed to be Hadrian and um, what's the, it's, it's actually, there's like a note in the back. So Hadrian and Antonus is like the inspiration behind like the core. And then it becomes, they're, they're very different people than these historical figures. But like Hadrian made this wall, right? Like he was grieving the loss of someone. And like, it's this whole thing apparently that I learned while reading the back of this book. Um, and Destroyer of Light was like a Persephone Hades retelling. So obviously this author is very inspired by historical legends and then uses them to make their own futuristic landscape. And this is perfect for me because it's like 200 pages no more than that. The other one was like 350 and that was a little long for me to be in her writing style, which is also incredibly descriptive, um, which really puts you in the scene. But again, it's just kind of an exhausting experience. And this one was just more fulfilling for me. It made me want to reread Destroyer of Light. It makes me want to like, there's another book that they might have coming out. I'm like, oh, because their ideas are just so cool. In a world where I'm just like searching for coolness, this, this was really interesting. <laughs> such a fascinating idea. So if you're someone like me who likes to be challenged once in a while and you only want to be challenged for a short period of time, I would pick this up and it like, yeah, it's just, it's just really interesting. And I would love to talk to more people about it. So if you do pick it up, come find me in the comments of this video, in my discord, etc. The other thing that like I finished, but I didn't really like finish, but like, if you don't know, the Way of Kings books come in two volumes. So I finished the first volume. <laughs> I did that. So I'm on the second volume now, which is what that means is I've read parts one, two, and all the interludes in, in for part between parts one and two and two and three. And I'm in part three right now. Boy of Kings. It's been good. I've been really enjoying my slow read. It just feels weird because it's just going so slowly, but that's just because my reading time is just non-existent. And I'm like, I'm already mourning the loss of a character, kind of like not death, um, but characters kind of go through it in Stormlight. And there's a character who you meet in Way of Kings who I really like. I, a lot of people don't like them that much. I'm being vague, so I don't ex like, you know, distort your experience. But as the series goes on, their personality kind of goes through some changes. And it's just like, man, I really like them in this book. And I don't dislike them in other books, but I miss the simplicity of their character in this book that makes sense. Um, and oh, it is really cool reading the epigraphs, knowing what we know from book four, and just like connecting the dots about things, because there are some like perspective warping things you learn in Oath Oathbringer and Rhythm of War that really, they, they color how you see the book. Um, so I'm enjoying that. Like, it's very nostalgic. It's also like just a fun reread. I do see how like, this is kind of a segue to like Wheel of Time people. I really can see how like Wheel of Time would feel like such a different thing if you reread all the books each time. Because that's what I've been doing with Stormlight. So Stormlight is like my Wheel of Time. I think Sanderson is kinder to his readers. I'm not gonna say better, but kinder in that each book of the Stormlight Archives is a complete thought, <laughs> okay? Like I get some catharsis. That is not the case with Wheel of Time. And I haven't found like a quote unquote weak book. Oathbringer's the weakest and like it's still a very solid book. It's just way too long. Um, so like for me, I still think Stormlight's a vastly better project than Wheel of Time, but I can see based off just my nostalgia of like, oh, yeah, it's so long and it's indulgent. And but like, look at these details that I missed and I didn't see it before. And like, I'm even highlighting things like, wait, that line seems leading. Oh yeah, there might have been someone in this scene. Like you don't see them the first time because you're not told they're important except for maybe this little line. It's, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. So yeah, slowly working on that. Another thing that this has been my um, commute read is Never Whistle at Night. This is a horror short story anthology. I am, where am I? I'm actually 70% of the way through. I'm pretty far because I <laughs> got stuck in traffic yesterday. So I got to read a fair bit. Yeah, I'm this far. So I've read this side. 
And I have the next story for me is Uncle Robert Rides the Lightning. Um, this has generally been good for me, as good as most anthologies are, like a four star. Nothing usually reaches the new sun's hype for me. I don't know why, but that person can really write stories that work for me. Um, but like some stories that I can highlight from here that I thought worked really well for me. Snakes are born in the dark. This one I still think about. This one has some very terrifying body horror elements, but I thought it worked so well. Um, it's about these three individuals who are going to go see, I believe there are these paintings on, I don't know if it's cave walls or just walls in general, but regardless, one of the people is being very disrespectful. And um, he's like the boyfriend of this woman and her cousin is indigenous. And he's just like, hey, don't do that. And he's like, why? What's going to happen? And then like, it's a whole thing. And be then suddenly the land seems to be cursing these individuals. And it's like this fever dream of a night where they're trying to get back to the car. And then there's some fun reveals at the end of the story. It was good. Um, I also really liked, I'm trying to find the other one I really liked. Ah, can I turn this page? Let's see. Do, 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 do. The prepper was terrifying for me. I really liked the prepper. And that's a person, about a person who has these delusions that a, de a zombie apocalypse is coming um, and how he preps for it. And he's like, he's reflecting back on this moment in his life. So you know he did something bad because he's like, he talks about his jail sentence and stuff like that. And he's reflecting back onto this moment. And it's the same moment as when his like grandfather is sick. And you're like, what are you going to do that landed you here for you know X number of years? And it's, I don't know, I think the chillingness for me was that delusional aspect of his mind. So it's been really solid, I think. Um, definitely some really good voices in here. The audiobook's really good if you like changing of narrators. I do think for me, what I'm learning, and like, it doesn't always matter if it's audiobook or not, but sometimes I think horror is probably better truly like sat in for me, like with my eyeballs. Cause I'm trying to think if there have been any audio experiences with horror that have been like my favorite of all time and like the closest might be our share of night. But that one isn't horror for me because of its atmosphere, <laughs> if that makes sense. And I kind of needed the audiobook to push me through some of the more like slice of life scenes. Cause I wonder if some of these stories would hit better for me if I had used my eyeballs. But that said, there were some stories that I truly did try to reread cause I felt like I was missing something that I think it was just a writing style disconnect or like a pacing disconnect. But it's good, I'd recommend it. So what am I working on? So I'm still working on Way of Kings and I'm still working on what Never Whistle at Night, but I've been trying to figure out my next book. And I did try a chapter of the Jinbot of Shantyport. And I'm happy to say that I really liked the first chapter. Um, my brain's just been mush, so I haven't like been feeling the motivation to get back to it. Um, but this author has a very voicey voice and I like his voice, it's a good voice. So I read The City Inside and this is, different from that but it's still just like oh yeah you do have a strong presence on the page this is what i remember from the city inside that's the only big comparison i would make between the two um and this is like an aladdin retelling in space and i think what i'm liking is how i'm learning about this world because we have our three characters we have oh god do i even know their name i think one's lena who's our aladdin we have bador who is abu the monkey and he's a small monkey robot which i think is very cool and then we have this like narrator who is the spot, who I think is supposed to be like our genie. Um, unsure, I've only just met them. Actually, it's he. The book even told me his pronouns are he. <laughs> and he's so cute. <laughs> he's an adorable way of perceiving things, things so far for me. Um, Cause he's trying to be this third party, like truly just observer. He's supposed to chronicle people's stories. And then he's being kind of brought into it. And like, I just love his internal monologue and how the story explains how he can actually give you such a close third person of the other people. So like the monkey, he can straight up read the mind of. So whenever we're third person with Bador, that's why. And apparently this bot's just really good at reading facial features and stuff. And learning about this family and their relationship to the current government and like the corruption of this place. It's just interesting now talking about it. Maybe I will actually sit down and read this, but I wish I had the audiobook of this. Oh my gosh, there's no audiobook of this. Why? Ah, and I don't have the ebook yet, which is annoying. But like my library, like they only have a few copies and everyone wants to read it apparently. And like, yeah, it's like, ah. but I'm excited to get back into this. But like I said, I've only read one chapter. It's just, I like the voiciness and it seems like a really cool world. Um, and it seems really well thought out. So we'll see. I'm also intimidated because like, it's not super long. Like this poundage of pages, like kind of thicker than it looks, but it's 400 pages. So I'm like, kind of want to read something a little shorter to give me the serotonin of like, you finished a thing, Angela, go you, because I've been reading such long stuff. So I have not started, but I did purchase Rose House by Katie Martin because I did my video earlier this week. And I'm like, you know, 
you're never gonna get this from the library. The library never has the ebook of this. You're just gonna have to buy it. <laughs> and so I did, um, cause like I can't get the physical copy. That was a subterranean press thing and I did not spend money on that. And I think the resale value is like $200 and I'm, I'm sorry, I won't even spend $20 on a novella, like much less 200, that's not happening. Um, and so this seems like it's like a technological haunted house adjacent thing based off like one sentence I read in the synopses. <laughs> and so that's a novella. So that could be fun to read and like consume this weekend. Um, but again, no audiobook for that. And like, I have things I want to do that are audiobook. And like, yes, I could listen to the Way of Kings audiobook, but I kind of get Wheel of Time flashbacks when I do that. It's very annoying. Um, and also I tried to immersion read it. And I don't know if this would happen with the Kindle. I'd have to check. So immersion reading, if you're new here, it's like when I listen and read at the same time. It's really nice and helps me focus, especially at times like this where my brain can be very like, la and tired. And so I was trying to read one of the chapters in Way of Kings. That isn't like one of my favorites, but I like still like it. So I was gonna like have the audiobook help me through it. And I don't know what they did when they when they wrote this, but they edited it dramatically <laughs> from whatever they gave Kramer back in the day to say out loud. And like I say dramatically, but like what I mean is like the content's the same, but like the sentences will be like flipped in their syntax or will change words. And we do that multiple times a page or a paragraph. And I'm like, this is so distracting. <laughs> so I can't immersion read it with my fancy copies. I haven't tried with my Kindle copy yet. And like, usually the Kindle copies are the most up-to-date edits of things. Like they get updated without your like permission or anything like that. And I would assume it would be close to what the leather bound was. So I don't know, I haven't tried. It was very distracting, did not enjoy that. So I can listen to the audiobook if I'm not immersion reading. I just don't love, like Kramer does okay, especially in this one. I feel like by Oathbringer, he gives people accents that I don't agree with because I've only ever listened to Oathbringer for the audiobooks. This is my first time listening to Way of Kings and right now he's fairly neutral. But I distinctly remember Dalinar and Adolin having voices in Oathbringer that I was like, whoa, that's not, those aren't my people. <laughs> like. I don't know. So right now it's like fairly neutral and doesn't bother me. So I might do that. Cause like there's some chores I want to do, some errands I want to run. And sometimes like I can't listen to Never Whistle at Night because when I start a story, I want to be able to finish it. So it's not very easy to like pick up and put down. So I don't know. That's where my reading's at. It's a little weird. Um, in terms of movies, I did go see Argyle, <laughs> which was very fun. I had a good time with it. I mean, it's just silly. It's just a silly action movie, you know, with one of the, it's like, it's the like equivalent of like a romance, but like the action version of that genre, you know, like you kind of know how it's going to end. Um, and you know, it's going to be wacky and oh man, it was, I would have hated reading this book. I'm almost positive, but watching the movie version of whatever this was, was super fun. And you know, even though Henry Cavill's haircut is awful and his suits don't fit quite right, he's still, he's still good. He's still, I still enjoy it. I still cannot believe, like, I love Henry Cavill in Witcher. I love him in Argyle. I'm really excited about him in this new World War II film. He looks really funny in that. I like him even in Stardust. What happened with Superman? Because I tried to rewatch Man of Steel and like part of it's the script, but also he is providing negative charisma <laughs> to that portrayal of Superman in Man of Steel. And I'm just like, what is this? What is this? Like even Brooding Boy, I've seen him do well. Like Superman's not even Broody Boy. He's just like, just nothing. Just, just blank slate, no thoughts, only vibes, not even good vibes, not even interesting vibes. Anyways, I liked Argyle. It's just fun popcorn. Sometimes you need that. We laughed. It had silly music scenes. There's a kitty cat. I had a good time. I also really liked the actress who's in it and I'm forgetting her name, but she was in Jurassic World and she was in um, Black Mirror for an episode. The episode that was like about social media ratings or something like that. One of the Black Mirror episodes back when people cared <laughs> about Black Mirror <laughs> back in the day. All right, that's it for this video. Let me know what you're reading, doing, watching this weekend, if you're doing anything fun. Otherwise, um, if you want to just leave an emoji, right? Emojis to let me know you're here. Um, you can leave a monkey for the gin bot of Shantyport. I think that'd be fun. And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.